Before you start this episode, this is just a reminder that History Hack does have a Patreon account and a Ko-fi account as well. You can either register to subscribe and throw us a few quid every month, or simply buy us enough caffeine to continue through to the next episode. Because frankly, we run on fumes most of the time. Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of History Hack. Today I am with Alex, um, who's going to introduce our special guest. Hi Alex. It is a special guest as well, because the last time we saw it, he basically blew our minds. Um, with the princes in the tower, but now he's blowing our minds with uh, something several hundred years before. So Matt Lewis is a writer and historian who specialises in medieval history. He's written a book on the War of the Roses, one on Richard, third Duke of York, and two historical fiction books on Richard the Third. But he's here today because he's gone into the weeds, haven't you, Matt? There's no harm in roaming around. I mean, I I worry about myself because I seem to be attracted to historical civil war. So I wrote, wrote a book about the anarchy, which is kind of the, an earlier civil war. Uh, and this kind of felt a little bit like the sequel to the anarchy. So I just mm. kept going in the same direction. Makes sense, I suppose. And like by being medieval, you do get a thousand years to play with. Unlike us two, we get five. So uh, you're That's better off. Mean, and the best <laughs> millennium in human history, you know, all the best things happen in the medieval period. <laughs> I want to put you <laughs> history off with Lockie, who says that nothing happens between the dinosaurs and the French Revolution. Uh, I want to get you too drunk and see you go at each other one day. Um, but we've had episodes about Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine um, before. So, Matthew, what are you going to tell us that's new? What? How are you framing the story for us to uh, blow our minds this time? Hopefully, just by looking more closely at their relationship, the way that they interacted with each other. So the book I wrote was effectively a joint biography. So you tend to either get one on Henry II or one on Eleanor of Aquitaine. But this was aimed squarely at telling both of their stories together, because without understanding both of them, you can't properly understand either of them. And I think understanding their dynamic sheds different light on some of the the points in their story that are usually taken as as read as fully understood and as well what we find very rarely in history is that the woman trumps the man she's a far more recognizable name than he is which we'll get to but let's start with Eleanor what does her early life look like I mean it's it's a bit hectic and chaotic and difficult in a lot of ways um she she's born we think in 1124 so her date of birth because she's a medieval woman, nobody mm. knows. So I, I'm always conscious when I talk about this stuff. I must sound horrendously misogynistic in some of the things that I say, but <laughs> they're just facts of dealing with medieval people quite often. Um, her, her date of birth is often given as 1122, but we have a family genealogy that gives her age as 13 in 1137, which would put it probably more likely around 1124. So we're not even 100% sure when she's born. Um she is the, the daughter of William X, the Duke of Aquitaine. So all Dukes of Aquitaine have to be called William. It's just the law. That's not um, confusing at Christmas, is it? Well, no. You know, <laughs> that's William the Ninth, and it goes all the way back from there. Um, her first son is called William because she's only ever really interested in Aquitaine. Um, she has... Uh, her mom is Einor of chateau Loray, and it's been suggested that her name, Eleanor, comes from being Alia Ionor, so another Ionor. So she's sort of named after her mother, perhaps. Um, but even that is a story in itself. So uh, Ionor is the daughter... This is going to get really complicated, really. <laughs> Ionor is the daughter of Eleanor's grandfather's mistress. OK. So her granddad, William the Ninth, who is a huge character in his own right, he's um, considered an early troubadour. He was basically a rude poet. Um, and a bit of a rogue. He had an affair with a woman who is fantastically named Dangereuse de Lille Bouchard. Um, she was married at the time. Um, so Einor is her daughter with her husband, but then Eleanor's granddad had an affair with her grandmother. It's weird. Um, but yeah, you know, William the Ninth apparently used to go into battle with uh, a picture of Dangereuse painted on his shield because he loved her so much. Um, he kicked his wife out of their castle and gave her her own tower in the castle. Um, so in many ways, uh, a bit of a terrible rogue. Uh, Eleanor had a, a younger sister who's often called Petronilla. So again, her name changes a little bit in various stories, but we normally call her Petronilla. And she also had a brother called William, unsurprisingly, because he was going to be Duke of Aquitaine. He's known as William Igrit. 
Uh, so William dies in 1130 at the age of four and uh, Eleanor's mother dies around about the same time as well. Um, so she effectively becomes her father's heir at that point. And her dad doesn't seem to make any effort to, to remarry or to produce another son to be the next Duke of Aquitaine. So Eleanor is left there for several years as her father's heir and the next Duchess of Aquitaine. And I think in terms of her upbringing, Aquitaine is often viewed as this kind of really lively, relaxed environment in contrast to the, the very grey, austere, um, straight-laced Paris in the north of France. So Aquitaine kind of sits there between Italy and Spain and France and has lots of different influences going on. Um, but it's generally seen as a, a quite a lively, colourful, bright relaxed place to have been brought up and I think that influences a lot of Eleanor's later experiences in life. Our listeners who are aware of Eleanor of Aquitaine's story um, will probably know um, her first marriage to King Louis of France who she married in 1137. Can you tell us a little bit about her time as Queen Consort of France and, and how that all ended? Yeah so Eleanor's dad um, dies during a pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela in what's now Spain. He's only about 38 when he dies. It's quite unexpected. Um, but as I said, he'd made no effort in the, the six or seven years since his wife had passed away to remarry or anything like that. So when news arrives back that he's died, Eleanor is placed into the care of Louis VI, the King of France, who sees a, a great opportunity because Louis has a son who is about the same age as Eleanor, isn't married. And this is a chance to get his hands on the massive territories of Aquitaine in the south of France. So Louis VI very quickly arranges a marriage between his son, who's also called Louis, because there's only three names to remember in this whole thing, really. Um, and kind of within weeks of their marriage, Louis VI dies. So by the time they get back to Paris, Louis comes down to Aquitaine to marry Eleanor. By the time they get back to Paris, he's Louis VII and she is queen of france at the age of maybe about 13 or 14 depending on where we put her date of birth so she's going into this completely different environment in her early to mid teens all of a sudden she's not only the duchess of aquitaine she's now the queen of france as well uh, and being pulled out of that that aquitanian environment into this slightly drabber um, atmosphere in france but initially i think it's generally considered that the, the relationship went fairly well, at least in the sense that the two seem to have been quite close. There's lots of stories that Louis loved Eleanor, which has to be turned by the chroniclers into a story that she he loved Eleanor too much. Um, so she was behind all of the bad things that happened. It was her terrible influence over him. Um, but she, she does seem to have this good relationship with Louis and lots of influence over him. That does start to cause problems fairly early. So she encourages Louis to help her press an Aquitanian claim to the county of Toulouse. It's a whole long story, but Dukes of Aquitaine claimed to be Counts of Toulouse and they weren't ruling there at the moment. So I think Eleanor thinks, well, now I'm married to the King of France. I can sort this one out. So she takes Louis down there on campaign. All goes horribly wrong. Louis messes it up and they have to sort of retreat without getting control of Toulouse. Eleanor's sister also goes with her to Paris, ends up getting into an affair with a much older married man. And he... Uh, he causes all sorts of problems because of his his marriage and essentially again Eleanor gets Louis to get involved in this and it causes all sorts of problems amongst his nobility so her influence over him is starting to cause problems. 1147 so kind of 10 years into their marriage they famously head off on the second crusade so they go to the holy land uh, to try and take back Jerusalem and this is just a period that is fraught with more and more problems. By now Louis's advisors are really unhappy that Eleanor seems to have so much influence over him because that means that they don't. So they're looking for reasons to kind of get between the couple and to cause problems for them. And this experience of going on crusade, I mean, that you know, there aren't many medieval queens who go on crusade. Even just to have done that mm. is an incredible experience for her. But we get things like, so the, the army, when they arrive in the Holy Land, they, they go to cross this mountain called Mount Cadmos. And the guy leading the army has an instruction not to allow them to get too strung out because then they'll get ambushed by lots of, of raiders who are laying in wait for them. He messes this up. 
decides there isn't enough room where they wanted to stop. So he strings the army out further than he was meant to. They get attacked. Louis is almost killed in some of the fighting that goes on. Some of his bodyguard around him are killed. And Eleanor gets the blame for this because the guy that was leading the army is one of her vassals. So he's an Aquitanian who reports to Eleanor. So she gets the blame for all of this. They go and visit her uncle Raymond, who is the Prince of Antioch, one of the, the Crusader states. And this this rumour emerges quite early on that she had an affair, a sexual affair with her, her own uncle, Raymond. And I think if you read the sources and, and read between the lines a little bit of what they're saying, what seems to have actually happened is that Raymond had strong feelings about the, the military direction that the crusade should take. He wanted Louis to attack specific places. Louis just wanted to go to Jerusalem because Louis was more concerned about going on pilgrimage to Jerusalem than he really was about picking any fights and Raymond sort of tried desperately to get Louis to do what he counselled and Eleanor seems to have taken the line that you know this is a guy who's in it this guy knows the land he knows the territory he knows what we should be doing if he's advising us to do this maybe we should do it and Louis won't go along with this so this turns into the only reason chroniclers can come up with for, for Eleanor going against her husband and siding with her uncle is that they were having an affair together you know there can't possibly be a rational explanation like she knew what she was talking about and she believed her uncle knew what he was talking about so you get these stories that Eleanor is kind of ripped away in the middle of the night she, she asks to stay in Antioch with her uncle Raymond and help him out and Louis throws a massive fit and and drags her away in the middle of the night so sort of kicking and screaming away to Jerusalem um, and actually before they make it back to France after the crusade Raymond would be killed in some fighting and you wonder whether Eleanor blamed Louis to some extent for her uncle's death for not sort of listening to what he said so you even get later crazy stories that Eleanor planned to run off with Saladin who was about 10 years old at the time that she's in the Holy Land um, but ultimately you know they spend an Easter in Jerusalem which must have been an incredible experience for a, a medieval Christian to spend you know, Easter in the, the holiest of cities um, but by the time they come home they're in trouble. Uh, the relationship seems to be falling apart. They visit the Pope on the way back, who blesses a bed for them to sleep together in and forbids them to get to, to separate. I nearly said divorce, but we shouldn't really talk about divorce during this period. They have marriages annulled. Um, and uh, they get back to France. Nine months after they, they sleep together in this blessed bed, they have a child, but it's a daughter, their second daughter. And Louis desperately, desperately needs a son by this point to succeed him on the throne of France and so ultimately their marriage comes to an end in 1152 with an annulment on the grounds of consanguinity which is exactly what the Pope had forbidden them from doing but the reality behind it is that Louis needs a son and he's, he's getting a bit panicky and jumpy and he wants to remarry because he's blaming Eleanor for the fact that they can't have a son. Of course he is <laughs> because men yeah, <laughs> and this is this is where I think Eleanor must have really, really got under Louis' skin because uh, you know, she goes off and has a pile of them, else. doesn't she? As well, yeah. <laughs> sons. Within a year yeah. of her first marriage, she's got a son, and then she has four more sons after that. So then everyone must be looking at Louis and thinking maybe she wasn't the problem. Yeah, <laughs> like a dick now because yours doesn't work. Um, can we just go back and do what History Hack does best and rabbit hole? You mentioned that she only cares about Aquitaine. Um, as a 20th century historian, I hear that word because I hear her name. I know it's somewhere that's now in France. Why? Why? What is Aquitaine? Is it amazing? Uh, where is it? Like for listeners that aren't familiar. So it sits in the southwest of what is currently France. So mm. up against the border of what is now Spain. Um, almost heading towards the the Alps and the, the the access to Italy, which is where Toulouse is, to the east of Aquitaine, which is the bit of land I, I mentioned they were fighting over. So it's a, it's a huge piece of land. And the thing about French kings during this period is they control a really small piece of land around yeah. Paris. And they rely on these ties of fealty to, to counts and dukes around France to prop them up as king. And what Aquitaine is, is a really loosely controlled collection of counties. So the Dukes of Aquitaine are, are Counts of Poitou, which is in north, the north part of Aquitaine. And they're, they're in a similar situation to the King of France. As long as they don't pull too hard on these ties of loyalty, it all stacks up and they get to be Duke of this incredibly large area, mm. which at various times has been 
um, a kingdom. You know, Charlemagne set it up as one of the the kingdoms when he split when his empire was split up. It became a, a briefly a kingdom. So it always had this idea of of independence, separation from the rest of France. It it felt, I think, much more like a Mediterranean country than the north of France, kind of on the North Sea. So there's a really different atmosphere down there. They even spoke a different language in Occitan, which is a slightly different dialect from the French that was spoken in other places. So there's a really distinct identity in this place in the south of France. This but really also, sunny, beautiful place. Like, I'm starting to figure out region. when she gets yeah, to France and England why she's still so attached. I mean, if this was a movie, you would literally be walking out of the sunshine with the birds around you into the drab, bare castle walls where no more music and it's all miserable in comparison, I think. Um, and I think lots of the actions that we see in her life constantly betray her overriding concern being the future of Aquitaine. Who's going to be the next Duke of Aquitaine? How is Aquitaine going to maintain its independence in in whatever situation it finds itself in? And we see that time and time again throughout her life as her kind of overriding political interest. Thanks. I just think that really helps like flesh her out and show you what she was about because obviously we're English and we go, yeah, but then she comes to England and her life really starts and actually, no, it's the reverse. Absolutely not. I think she would see that as being dragged even further away from where she wanted to be. Yeah. Um, and, and she must have felt to some extent, she, she comes from a, a a line of really strong women who were rulers in their own right quite often. So in the Iberian Peninsula in Spain, it wasn't unusual to have women who ruled. And even in France, you had women who acted as regents and it was the norm. Mm. And I think her being kind of the, so the her dad was William the the eleventh. There was there was eleven Williams all in a row, all male dukes who maintained mm. Aquitaine. I think her her big fear was that she would be the woman who came along, and because she was a woman, it would get consumed into a husband's set of lands, and it would become kind of an afterthought, just part of something else. And I think she didn't want to be the person who had allowed that to happen simply because she was a woman. So she fought yeah. as hard as she could to be a duke. If mm. she wasn't going to be someone else's wife, she was a Duke of Aquitaine. That, that, so you've already blown my mind, because now I'm looking at her in a completely different way. I'm looking at her in a kind of way that's sort of like, she doesn't go to begin a career as Queen of England. She sort of gets, she's being cast further away from, like you say, where she would want to be. But we do have to get her to England, because we have to start talking about how she punks Louis by having all these sons. Um, so let's look at Henry. Uh, he's got an interesting upbringing, hasn't he? He has. I mean, he is a real adventurer even before he gets to the throne you know he has so much at such a young age um he's born in uh, march 1133 so he's nine ten years younger than eleanor so a bit of a toy boy he's <laughs> born in le mans his dad is geoffrey the count of anjou and his mother is empress matilda you know if this guy wanted powerful women in his life there are two of the most powerful women in the medieval yeah. world um he is incredibly well educated we have notes of who his tutors were while he's in Anjou while he's in England for a while and then grammarians who teach grammarians who teach him while he's back in Anjou again and and you know he's an incredibly intelligent well educated man who's really interested in books um there are later accounts of him that say he spoke kind of every language from the the Atlantic to the Holy Land at least to some extent you know he could get by in almost every language uh, he's held up as a, a very well-educated intelligent man which i think is slightly different to this the the furious image that we have of henry charging around fighting with everybody it's just another facet that, that helps to round these people out you know he definitely was someone who was an absolute bundle of energy and would explode all over the place when necessary yeah, I mean, this is what's like so fascinating about talking to you about medieval history and dan jones because they are two-dimensional literally the images we have of them are these people from a period before you've even got like proper portraiture um they are 2d and actually seeing them as fully rounded people with like complicated lives and feelings like yeah he can be that guy charging around but also as well he's he's not that guy all the time yeah, and some of what they do always has to be for show. So they, you know, particularly kings and noblemen that we read about have all got a public image to think about, which may not be the same as what they are in private. 
you know, they, they have to behave in certain ways. So I think it's always important that, I mean, I always think wherever we see someone in history who's presented as very one dimensional, we should always look deeper because nobody's really like that. None of us are like that. You know, we, we would all like to think we've got several facets to, to our character and we can be different things at, at different times. Um, and so, you know, Henry is quite often just viewed as this slightly furious little bundle of energy. And he was that, but he was lots else. I mean, 1142 was the first time he comes over to England. So when he's about nine years old, he's sent to see his uncle, Robert of Gloucester, who is Empress Matilda's half brother. And he spends a year or so in England then. Again, being educated, Robert is considered a great warrior, general, chivalric figure. So he's associating with these kinds of people. Um, and then we know that in 1147, at the age of 14, he tries to invade England. So he gets together a bunch of knights, promises and loads and loads of money, sails over to England, and it all goes horribly wrong. And he reaches the point where he can't afford to pay these men that have come with him, which is, you know, terribly dishonourable for him. So he goes to his mom and says, can I have some pocket money? I need to pay off these knights who come over with me. Matilda says, no, you can't. You didn't get permission to do this. You know, sort your own mess out. So he goes <laughs> to his uncle Robert and says, Uncle Robert, can I have some money to pay off these knights, please? And his uncle Robert says, no, you can't. And he actually ends up... Brilliant. This is like Nepo baby getting what's coming to him. Absolutely. You know, get on the naughty step, sort your own mess out. You know, we're not bailing you out. And Henry ends up going to King Stephen. So the guy who he's tried to invade the kingdom and take the crown from, he goes to King Stephen and says, look, I've messed up here, but this is making me look really bad. I can't pay my own knights. And Stephen gives him the money to pay his knights, which in one way makes sense because it gets them out of the kingdom. But I think it's also an interesting moment that plays into the, the later stages of the anarchy, because I suspect it kind of builds up this well of either respect between the two men or or even friendship between the two men, because that's the easiest way to explain the way that the, the anarchy eventually comes to an end. So, but, you know, at 14, we've got this crazy kid getting together a bunch of his mates and trying to invade a kingdom. And then we see kind of later as the anarchy progresses, Empress Matilda takes a, a back step, particularly after 1141, when she's come very, very close to taking the throne, but failed. And what she does then is, is just keep her son's claim alive. So she, she pr keeps alive the idea that he should succeed to the throne next as Henry I's grandson. So he spends most of his life with this idea that he should have all of this stuff it should be his but it isn't and that's that's something to grow up with in the back of your mind isn't it you should be a king but there's a guy over there who's stolen it from and that's just getting me thinking about some of the um kind of other later kings and things like henry the seventh where his mother margaret Beaufort is bringing him up you know like as you know you should be the rightful ruler you should be the king and again kind of growing up with that kind of sense of of destiny or responsibility and entitlement, you know, it, it, yes. it shapes someone in a very specific way to be brought up to believe that all of this stuff is yours. Absolutely. Um, and we're now going to go on to Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine as a couple. Um, and they're kind of one of my favourite royal power couples of the medieval era and have a really interesting story. Um, but of course, um, if readers are aware of um, of their kind of the rest of their marriage, which we'll talk about later, obviously very dysfunctional family as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about when they met? Because I think that um, was quite unusual. Yeah, well, I mean, the first time we know that they meet is in Paris in 1151. Um, so Eleanor is almost 30. She's in her late 20s by this point. Henry is in his late teens. And he goes to Paris to, to give homage to Louis for Normandy, which his dad has won and handed over to him in 1150. So we know that's the first time they meet, and you get these kind of romantic notions later that, you know, their eyes met across the, the crowded throne room. Uh, I doubt it was anything like that at all. In fact, there are rumours after this that um, Henry's dad has an affair with Eleanor while they're in Paris, because there's later stories that, you know, he ends up marrying a woman who his dad had had an affair with. Again, there's no evidence to back this up, but if you want to throw a bit of mud at a medieval woman, an affair is always the way people seem to go with it. And then so when Eleanor's marriage ends um, in 1152, she very quickly understands, I think, that 
she has a big problem now. So she, she's Duchess of Aquitaine again. She's no longer Queen of France. Uh, Louis has tried to keep Aquitaine for their daughters, but he can't make that stick. And on the way back home from Paris to Aquitaine, there are two attempts to abduct Eleanor and forcibly marry her. The first one by Theobald, who's the Count of Bright and Champagne, related to King Stephen in England. And the second is by a guy called William of Anjou, who happens to be Henry's younger brother. <laughs> so this is a big family affair. You know, now her younger, uh, his younger brother is trying to abduct Eleanor and marry her. So she gets back to Aquitaine and I think she quite pragmatically thinks, I probably need another husband here. Be but if I need a husband, I need one who can stand up to Louis. And she must have been racking her brains of eligible bachelors around Europe who are in the position of having that kind of power, authority, the, the ability, the personality that she would need in someone who can stand up to Louis. And, and Henry must have been the obvious candidate. This might be where she's casting her mind about and thinking, hang on, that young guy who was in Paris a few years ago, he could be a good bet. So he's gathering this army to try and invade England again in 1152. And Eleanor writes to Henry and said, and says, would you like to come and marry me? And Helen, uh, sorry, Henry kind of drops everything and charges down to Aquitaine because this is too good to turn down. You know, he's on the verge of invading England, but he's currently Duke of Normandy. His dad dies. So he becomes Count of Anjou and Maine and Touraine and, and those kind of central French regions. So if he gets Aquitaine, he's got this huge slice of Western France which is all kind of his. So he speeds down there and marries Eleanor within about eight weeks of her annulment of her marriage to Louis. And, I mean, I think it's fair to say that Louis is fuming. Not, yeah. least, because, <laughs> not least because they're both his vassals. So as Duke of Normandy and Count of Anjou, Henry is his vassal. As Duchess of Aquitaine, Eleanor is his vassal. And, and he would have expected them to ask him for permission for such a significant match between two such huge powerful landholders in his territory and they don't they just get married and then tell him later and he is fuming that's brilliant i love it um how is henry wrapped up in a dispute with king stephen because it's a mess in england at the time isn't it ah uh, yes and no see i i argue that the anarchy isn't quite as anarchic as mm. the anarchy makes it sound but um so apart from his invasion of 1147, he, he does grow up as this kind of figurehead of opposition to Stephen in England. And in 1152, straight after marrying Eleanor, he, he heads off to England to, to try and press his claim. And there's there's been this long period of stalemate um, in the, the anarchy at this point. And when Henry arrives, it, it kind of continues. There's a whole lot of posturing. We get several times when armies line up on either side of the river. And we're told, you know, it was raining quite heavily. The river was really deep and, and they're kind of on either side going, oh, if this river wasn't so big, I'd get over there and beat you up. <laughs> but they never actually managed to, to get to the point of having a fight. There's one instance where Henry and Stephen, we're told in a chronicle, have a, a meeting on their own, which is always tricky because who knows what was said when they have this meeting on their own to write it in a chronicle. But we're told they have their, this meeting on their own on an island in the middle of a river between their two forces in which they both talk about how terrible it is that no one will fight for them and you know how much they'd love to have a massive scrap, but no one else will join in. So you get this kind of weird stalemate and then you, it's a kind of a series of unfortunate events that allow the end of the anarchy. Stephen's oldest son, Eustace, dies unexpectedly and Stephen's second son, William, makes it pretty clear that he's not interested in being king. He just doesn't want to be involved in all this fighting He's actually an incredibly wealthy nobleman in his own right, and he's happy to stay that, that way and stay out of, of the, the fight for the crown. So we get a situation where Stephen effectively adopts Henry and appoints him as his heir in 1153. And then Stephen kind of dies in October 1154, so about a year later. And then we get Henry and Eleanor come over to England in December and are crowned on the 19th of December at Westminster Abbey. And that kind of that break of a couple of months between the death of the previous king and the coronation was a real break for recent history. If you think Henry's grandfather, Henry I, had kind of you know, his brother gets killed in a hunting accident and he leaves the body there on the ground and rides off to go and get himself crowned. And then Stephen had got crowned in a hurry when uh, Henry I had died. 
so to allow that kind of gap for someone else to potentially step into is is quite a break for recent history and it's not quite clear whether henry is waiting to see if anyone else moves you know has he got another enemy who's out there lurking who might move or is this just a a, a demonstration of supreme confidence He's absolutely sure that he's got all of this wrapped up. No one's going to dare to oppose him so he can afford to take his time. That's really interesting. And as you um, kind of allude to there, the transition between one monarch to the next in this period is something that can be quite fraught and that, you know, various examples of, um, you know, of kind of um, usurpations and all kinds of things happening. And um, yeah, how does kind of Henry, I mean, there, if it was a supreme sign of confidence, I mean, I don't know how it kind of went afterwards, but how did he kind of try to consolidate his power and make sure that he could kind of make a good start to his own dynasty? Yes, and part of the problem you get with succession in this period is that up until 1272, when Henry III changes the law, there isn't an automatic right of succession for from one king to another, from a father to a son or anything like that. So when a king dies, you get this interregnum effectively until the next king is crowned. There's no king's peace, so there's no law and order to be kept, and it can be a real problem. And that's why people like Henry I and Stephen are able to to jump into that vacuum and, and fill the void successfully. Um, and part of, part of the way that Henry gets control of things so quickly in 1154 is... As I mentioned earlier, you know, I question how anarchic the anarchy was. We call this civil war the anarchy, but I don't know that there ever really was anarchy. Henry gets government uh, departments and government functions, things like the Exchequer, up and running and, and recording things again so fast that I think it really strongly suggests they never really stopped working under Stephen. Um, Scotland had taken a, a chunk of land from the north of England that Stephen had been kind of so distracted fighting Matilda that he hadn't really been able to address that issue. When Henry becomes king, Scotland falls into a, a minority crisis. They have a young king on the throne. So Henry simply marches up there and says, right, I'm having this back now. Anyone got a problem with that? And no one <laughs> is able to stand up to Henry. So he just gets all of that land back kind of really easily. Um, but this is where I do think we see Henry as a very energetic, active man. He is bombing around. I mean, by the time he's King of England, so he's King of England, Duke of Normandy, Count of Anjou, Maine and Touraine in the middle of France, and Duke of Aquitaine. This guy now owns land that stretches from Hadrian's Wall to the Pyrenees Mountains near the Mediterranean. So he's going to have to be active and busy and charging around all over the place. And I think particularly in England, what we see with him is him being utterly obsessed with taking back any right that his granddad, Henry I, had had. So his way of, of undoing Stephen's reign and the, and the anarchy... And disassociating himself with that is kind of looking at everything and saying, if my granddad had it, I want it and I'm going to get it back. And that's the basis on which he takes back the north of England from the King of Scotland. It's the basis on which he behaves in Normandy. It's the basis on which he behaves around the church and all of those kinds of things. So that's always his kind of measure of success. If he gets everything back that his granddad had, he'll consider himself a success. I'm going to come back to the church in a bit, but I just want to dig a bit further. Um, so... They've made Louis look like a dick, A, because they got married without asking him, B, because they then start spitting out sons like turbocharge. Uh, does, does he just get over this, Louis? Is there a rivalry between him and Henry? Um, like you would not believe. Louis is not trying <laughs> to let this go. It, it, I mean, it has made him look like a complete fool. It's is this like Stallone like... versus Schwarzenegger back in the 80s? It's Yeah, exactly that. I think it is 100% that. Um, full on local derby. I mean, where I am, this is Wolves playing West Brom. Um, and and if you, I mean, if you didn't know any better, this is like the perfect setup for some kind of TV drama or a comedy series, even or something like that. You know, this this woman who's been married to both men, who are in positions of incredible power that almost necessarily make them rivals. It's it's such an awkward, difficult situation. But yeah. So so Louis was already fuming that they got married. He's then additionally fuming and embarrassed that they've had a whole load of sons when he'd been trying to make out that Eleanor was the problem why they couldn't have any sons. Uh, so the, the first one they have is William um, in 1153. So almost straight after they get married, he only lives till 1156, but then they have four more sons on top of that as well. So, And it's significant, I think, that their first son is born while Henry is campaigning in England and Eleanor names him William because that's the name of Dukes of Aquitaine. 
that's where her focus still is, I think. Um, but Louis, aside from being annoyed and embarrassed, is also facing this increasing political threat of this couple who own way more of France than he owns. <laughs> that's pretty dangerous situation for him to be in. And I think he begins to focus all of his efforts on dismantling Henry's kind of growing portfolio in any way that he can do that. And he struggles because Henry is so militarily effective. Louis struggles to stand up to him in any kind of direct military way. And so he begins to look for other ways. And unfortunately for Henry, it's Henry's sons that kind of provide the the perfect answer for Louis and who end up causing all of the problems. And then there's things like, you know, the Thomas Beckett business. Louis's keen to get involved in all of that because it causes problems for for Henry. So he he will not let this go and he focuses so much of his effort for the rest of his life on dismantling everything that Henry's got and he hands that mission on to his son Philip as well. I love it. I love that there's just like a, a vendetta, ongoing vendetta grudge match between the two of them. Yeah, you worry that there was probably horses' heads in beds and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned Thomas Beckett there, who, of course, we have to discuss as well in relation to Henry, because that was also such kind of a, I mean, well, you can tell us how, how key it actually was um, in Henry's reign, but it's something um, listeners will be very aware of um, in terms of ha- what happened and the kind of myths around why, and then afterwards as well, Henry trying to atone for it. So can you tell us a little bit about your research into Henry and Beckett? Yeah, definitely. So I think to some extent, Henry would probably be annoyed and surprised that we think so much about Thomas Beckett, because I think to some extent, Beckett was a bit of an annoyance to Henry, but he had so much else going on that I'm not sure it was ever really top of his list of priorities, which annoyed Beckett and annoyed Louis as well, because they desperately tried to be. So Henry and Thomas Beckett have a brilliant relationship to begin with when they first come into each other's orbit. So Thomas is born uh, 1119, so he's kind of 14 years older than Henry. He's been in the service of the Archbishop of Canterbury, who's identified him to Henry when Henry becomes king as an incredibly able administrator and a, a, a good guy to have around. So Henry hires him as chancellor, which is kind of the the early equivalent of a a prime minister it's the most senior figure in medieval government and in that role Thomas is hugely effective incredibly efficient and he does all the bits of being king that Henry doesn't like because Henry kind of hates a lot of the pomp and ceremony that go with being a king Um, he he has a crown wearing ceremony at Worcester a few years after his coronation and Norman kings had always done they wore crowns a lot at Easter and Christmas and things like that to show off And Henry does this one at Worcester. And at the end of it, he takes his crown off, puts it on the altar at Worcester and says, I'm never going to wear a crown again. And he never does. Just not interested in in being king. And when Henry is trying to um, negotiate a marriage for his son to the daughter of Louis, so Henry's trying to build bridges, he can't be bothered to do a massive state entry into Paris. So he sends Thomas over to do it instead. And you get these chroniclers talking about this this huge procession of men and and crates of wine and barrels of beer and there's dogs and there's monkeys riding horses and all sorts of stuff and it sort of backfires because all the chroniclers are saying crikey if this is the king's advisor and he's this grand and impressive imagine what the king's going to be like but then henry just can't be bothered with all of that that kind of stuff but there are i think there are also hints of of a degree of rivalry between Henry and Thomas that might have been friendly, but which also I think might have sown some seeds of resentment in Thomas in particular. So you get these anecdotes of Henry and Thomas kind of ride past this elderly guy in the winter who is is wearing scraps of clothes and freezing. And um, Henry says to Thomas, you know, be a nice man and and give him a a robe. And uh, Thomas doesn't want to give him his nice new posh cloak. So Henry kind of rips it off his back, almost pulls him off his horse and gives this beggar Thomas's um, cloak. And, you know, everyone's laughing at Thomas. And there are reports of instances where Thomas is throwing these lavish posh feasts, the bit that Henry doesn't like to do. And Henry will have been out hunting all day and he just rides his horse right into the middle of Thomas's great hall, hops off the back of the horse, jumps over the table, you know, sits down and puts his muddy boots up on the table and starts eating and, and just kind of undermining 
Thomas, even though Thomas is doing the things that Henry wants him to do. So slightly weird dynamic there. And when the, the Archbishop of Canterbury dies, Henry decides that he can get more control over the church in England. So get back some of the rights that his granddad, Henry I, had by making Thomas Archbishop. There's lots of rivalry between church and state throughout Europe during this period as, as popes try to get more power and separate the church and, and secular rulers try to keep that authority. And so Henry thinks, well, I'll make my mate Thomas Archbishop of Canterbury and then he can just sign control of the church over to me and that'll be great. So Henry sends people to say to Thomas, great news, you're going to be Archbishop of Canterbury. And Thomas says, I don't, I don't want to be. Why would I want to be Archbishop of Canterbury? Um, and I think to some extent this is... This would almost be like retirement for Thomas. So he's, he's going to be mm. taken out of the, the highest political role in the government, be given this theoretically an incredibly prestigious position in the church, but then be forced to sign over any power that he might have had to Henry. He'll be the man that, that signed away all of the authority in the church in England to the king. And then he'll sort of sort of lounge there, you know, as a, an archbishop. Now he can't get married. He can't have children, anything like that that he might have wanted to do with his life. So he doesn't want to be archbishop. But Henry sort of forces him. Um, and then Henry, so he's consecrated as Archbishop in 1162. Henry puts this um, paper before the church called the Constitutions of Clarendon in 1164, which is essentially handing over loads of authority to Henry, saying that you can't take matters relating to the church outside of England to the Pope without the king's permission, all of this kind of thing. And, he, and Henry turns up, you know, all excited. My mate Thomas is going to sign this off. And Thomas says no and refuses to sign it. And so Henry flips out. Thomas ends up fleeing into exile. Henry begins to persecute anyone who's connected to Thomas. You know, lots of his family are driven into exile as well. Clearly, Henry's temper has broken at this point. And what Thomas does is go and hang out around the papal court, which is in France at the time, and also hangs out around the court of King Louis, and desperately looks for ways to cause trouble for Henry. And, and this goes on for years. And um, it almost seems to have been resolved in the end. It reaches the point, I think, where Thomas is just becoming an irritation to the Pope and to the King of France. He's not actually working as a weapon against Henry. He's just becoming increasingly annoying. And he tends to turn up whenever Louis and Henry have a peace sort of summit together. Thomas will turn up and throw a spanner in the work. So he's also now stopping Louis getting what he wants at various points as well. But in the end, it, it seems to be sorted out in 1170. Thomas goes back to England um, on the basis that he's he's now going to behave himself. He's going to be a good Archbishop of Canterbury. But Henry's in Normandy at the time. Thomas arrives in um, England and immediately excommunicates all of the people that have backed Henry in his arguments with Thomas. And this is the point where we get that kind of news of this reaches Henry. And that's where we get this outburst that Henry... Uh, is supposed to have made that leads to these kind of four knights heading off back to Canterbury who, and they end up kind of murdering Beckett uh, in late December 1170 in Canterbury Cathedral um, and that kind of that quote is, has often been given as who will rid me of this turbulent priest or that kind of, of quote but I think the, the most recent translation of the, the Latin record that we have of it is, is along the lines of uh, what miserable drones and traitors have I nourished and brought up in my household, who let their lord be treated by such uh, with such shameful contempt by a low-born cleric. So slightly less direct than what better, who, I think. Who who rid me of him? And it's more like he's having a go at everyone in the room, saying, you know, why are you letting me be treated like this? You know, well, and I think he's 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 aiming that at Thomas as much as anything else. You know, I've given this guy everything. Mm. I've literally picked him up from Cheapside in London. As a, he was working as a clerk for the Archbishop of Canterbury. I've made him the most important man in England, now the most important man in the church, and this is how he repays me. But that seems to get kind of twisted, um, misunderstood, perhaps. Uh, and again, I think there's more to the story of the knights going off after Thomas. There's more to Thomas's death than uh, is often understood. I think there's a degree of Thomas almost accepting martyrdom at this point as a final victory over Henry. Um and he's very quickly canonised, becomes a saint. You know, Louis uses Beckett's murder as a, a big weapon against Henry. You know, he's writing to the Pope saying, this is the most horrendous thing to happen in the history of humanity. You know, how can you allow this man to continue to be king? And it's just Louis making political capital. Mm. What was what was definitely shocking 
um, but it's another weapon that he can deploy against Henry. And and Henry ultimately brings this to an end when he he's facing all sorts of rebellions and uprisings in the continent and in England. And he he arrives back in England to try and face this and kind of diverts himself to Canterbury and goes and visits Thomas's tomb. And we're told that he spends the night kind of allowing the monks to to whip him with birch sticks and and saying prayers at Thomas's tomb and being repentant. And you know, news arrives in the morning that while he was doing all of this, the King of Scotland's been captured and the rebellion's fallen apart. So that seemed very much then as God kind of forgiving Henry and backing him. And, and that almost becomes a big turning point in Henry's reign and his career because he's kind of got God back on side and he's even got St. Thomas at his back now. Let's just duck back to the marriage between them. Like we, we've talked about how dynastically it's very successful, but on a personal level, is it the same? I think so. I mean, talking about love is always hard at this kind of distance in, in medieval relationships. I suspect there was a, a degree of love that developed. I think Henry, early in the relationship, we can see Henry kind of relying on Eleanor a lot as the much more experienced politician. You know, she's been a Queen of France. She's a Duchess of Aquitaine. He's keen to learn as much as he can from her. He knows you know, he's, he's been brought up around all of these great men. And I think as an educated man, he probably understood that you can learn a lot from other people. And Eleanor was someone he was able to learn a lot from. So it's difficult to talk about love. I would suggest it was probably there. Um, but they were certainly a devastatingly successful team as a, as a political duo ruling this massive collection of lands. They were absolutely incredibly successful. Eleanor, we see, is frequently regent in England when Henry has to be on the continent. She acts as regent in Normandy sometimes, even in Anjou, in Henry's home. Uh, and, and late in their relationship in 1168, she is sent back to Aquitaine as Duchess. And this is often seen as Henry is bored and fed up of Eleanor. You know, he's taken mistresses, perhaps. Um, he's got all of these young women around him and he doesn't want his ageing wife around him anymore. I think what happens in 1168 is, I mean, Eleanor's kind of in her mid-40s by this point. They've had loads and loads of children so aside from the four daughters they've got uh, four sons they've got daughters as well they're unlikely to have any more children and because her focus has always been Aquitaine I think this is kind of a like a golden handshake a retirement gift a big thank you from Henry to say now you can go and do what you've always wanted to do go and rule Aquitaine mm. don't worry about anything else anymore um Henry's trusted her to rule all of these places. They, they've they never necessarily had the re kind of relationship that relies on them being together a lot because they control so much lands that are so far apart that they have to be separate. So her going to Aquitaine isn't some kind of big break in a, in a relationship that had seen them living in each other's pockets up until that point. So I think this is much more like Henry saying, thank you for everything that you've done for me. Now you go back home and do what you've always wanted to do with your life. And we've got to mention their sons as well briefly. Um, so there's various kind of periods of conflict that arise in the family um, due to, I mean, you know, Henry's aging and still, you know, still healthy, still king. And he has these, you know, sons that are growing up and, and kind of want a piece of the power, a piece of the action. Could you briefly tell us a little bit about kind of the friction all of that causes in the family? Yeah, sure. So um, we mentioned William, who who unfortunately dies very young. Uh, after that, they have a Henry, um, who is frequently remembered as Henry the Young King. He's the only person ever to be crowned junior king of England in his father's lifetime. So this was a French tradition that helped secure the, the succession. Um, so we've got kind of Henry the Young King. We've got Richard, who goes on to become Richard I. We've got Geoffrey, who is Duke of Brittany for a while. And then we've got John, who goes on to become King John. Um and and they say so that the argument with Henry has always been that he was so unwilling to let go of power that his sons rebelled against him. I would argue that's not the case. Richard, for example, is installed as Duke of Aquitaine and he goes with Eleanor in 1168. He goes to Aquitaine to learn how to rule Aquitaine from the master, <laughs> from his mom. And he is effectively, although Aquitaine is still under Henry's control, really, he's effectively independently Duke of Aquitaine. Geoffrey is married to the heiress to Brittany and becomes Duke of Brittany. And so he is given 
a fair amount of power there as soon as he comes of age. I mean, John is too young really to be involved in very much that's going on at this time. But Henry, Henry the Young King, is the one that I think is a problem. So I suspect that Henry II saw something in his son that made him worried that this guy isn't ready. He he doesn't understand what it is. And lots of the sources talk about Henry the Young King being quite kind of frivolous. He's not committed to, to government. He doesn't learn how to rule all of these kinds of things. He's off on the tournament circuit all of the time which is something that Henry II disapproves of. He bans tournaments in England because he doesn't like them. So Henry the Young King goes off and spends all his time on the continent touring around the tournament circuit with people like William Marshall. You know, how cool is that? Just to be going off partying with William Marshall all the time. But I think Henry II sees his oldest son as not ready to rule because he's the one that is denied power where his younger two brothers are actually given a fair degree of power. So I don't think it's that Henry II won't give away power and authority i think there's something about henry the young king and it, and it's an odd thing because henry the young king rebels a couple of times and he actually dies in rebellion in 1183 in rebellion to his father and we get this situation at the end where, where henry the young king has been constantly promising to be reconciled with his dad and then going back into rebellion and henry the young king sends word to his dad to say look i'm i'm seriously ill i think i'm dying here can you come and see me and Henry kind of is walking out the door when all of his advisors say, you can't trust this guy. You know, he's done this so many times. He's pulled the wool over your eyes. You can't trust him. So Henry sends a ring off his finger to his son as a, a token of his, his love, but but doesn't go and see him. And Henry the young king does die. Um, and then Henry is so upset and distraught. There's there's one chronicle that, that credits him with saying, you know, I wish he would have lived longer to cause me more trouble. Because he, he desperately misses his son. He's he's in bits after Henry the Young King dies. Even though he dies in rebellion to Henry, causing him all of this trouble, as a father, and again, I think this is where we lack the, the depth of understanding these people. We see him as a king who has a son who's causing trouble. He's a dad mm. whose son has just died. And yes, they'd fallen out at the time. But, you know, how many times do we watch programmes these days and understand that that can cause problems when you think the last thing you said to someone was something said in anger. The last thing that Henry did was say, I won't come and see you because I think you're lying about dying. I mean, that, that's got to have hurt him and upset him. So I, I just think there is so much more depth to all of this. But the, the big problem with Henry's sons is that Louis manages to get into all of their ears. So this is where Louis's kind of master plan plays out. And he, you know, Henry the Young King marries uh, one of Louis's daughters from his second marriage. Uh, not one of Eleanor's daughters, because that would be weird. Yeah. Um, and and Henry goes to visit his father-in-law in Paris, and, and Louis really pours this on. So Louis understands this idea of a junior king perfectly well, because it's a French invention. But Louis real, really piles it on with, well, you know, you're a king, you've been crowned. Why don't you have any power? Why don't you have any authority? Aren't you the real king of England? And he really eggs him on. And this works with Henry the Young King. It then works with Geoffrey, who dies in 1186, whilst at the French court with... Uh, Henry's uh, with Louis's son Philip um, who succeeds him and carries on this kind of successful plan of getting between Henry and his son to try and break up this um, this Angevin set of land so Geoffrey dies in the midst of all of this as well and Richard falls in with Philip of France as well and when Henry II dies in 1189 he's literally being chased through the French countryside by Richard and Philip so again the the Capetian kings have managed to get between Henry and his sons. This is the real weak spot. And if Henry had hated his sons, it would probably have been easy to cut them cut them loose. But Henry desperately loved his sons, I think, and, and was endlessly frustrated and died, you know, torn to bits by the fact that his sons conspired against him with the kings of France. We started with Eleanor, so let's end with Eleanor because we're all out of time. Um, we've already said it. She's a rare example where a medieval woman is more famous than her medieval man or men. Why do you think she stands out like she does? It's such a hard question to answer. I mean, there's, there's some aspects of her story. I say that Eleanor had Eleanor lived three incredibly packed and full medieval lives. You know, if they'd been the lives of three separate people, 
as Queen of France who goes on crusade and then as Queen of England uh, and there's this kind of Angevin empire with sons that are causing problems all over the place that would be another fascinating story and life in itself and then after Henry's death you know she lives for another 15 years and is involved again in in Richard's reign in Richard being taken captive on the way back from the Holy Land she raises the the ransom to get him set free and travels across Europe to deliver it um, and she's involved in John succeeding Richard so she's incredibly politically active after Henry's death as well so they're almost three separate lives each one of which is is packed and impressive in its own right but you put those all together as one life for one woman and it's incredible and I think even in the time she she stands at this kind of point in time when misogyny particularly coming from the church was massively on the increase female rule in previous centuries had been far more acceptable than it is by Eleanor's time but she's grown up learning about all these great ancestresses that she had who ruled so why shouldn't she she inherits Aquitaine and is therefore tasked with protecting it as, as if she was a man you know, no one cares she doesn't care whether she's a man or a woman she just doesn't want Aquitaine to get lost and I think perhaps some of that Aquitanian fierceness and independence is an attitude she takes to Paris with her and to England with her and which she never ever gives up you know she never relinquishes that and it, it puts her in stark contrast to those places in northern Europe that are a bit more um, sort of dull and boring um, and grey I guess and I think so often we can very clearly see Eleanor working in her own right to achieve her own aims and doing what she wants to do and making what she wants to have happen happen and I think there are so few other women that you can see doing that and being successful in it particularly on a, a huge international stage like Eleanor does it that she, she just stands out as such an impressive person. Well, that's such a fitting way to end our podcast episode today thank you so much Matt and um, can you remind our listeners of um, the name of your book on Henry II and Eleanor Ractain and when and where they can get their hands on a copy? Uh, yeah, it's called Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine founding an empire, uh, in which I argue that what they founded wasn't really an empire. So um, it's probably not available in good bookstores anywhere, but you can get it in all terrible bookshops and it's available online everywhere. Uh, it's out in paperback uh, about now. Um, and yeah, hopefully it takes a look at the these two fascinating characters, puts them together and looks at their relationship together and the ways that they worked together and sometimes against each other and I think that just enriches both of their stories really. Wonderful thank you very much Matt it's lovely to have you back on the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster as a result we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests latest books you can support them and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top of the line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.